Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 202 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Joyce Carol Oates. She's the author of more than 70 books, including the national bestsellers We Were the Mulvaney's and Blonde. Among her many honors are the Penn Malamud Award for Excellence in Short Fiction and the National Book Award. And we'll be speaking with her today about her new book, The Doll Master and Other Tales of Terror. And now, here's our interview with Joyce Carol Oates. All right, so we're here with Joyce Carol Oates. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Okay, so your new book is called The Doll Master and Other Tales of Terror. So just tell us a bit about the story behind this book and how it came about. Well, of the stories I've written over a period of time, and I have um, an ongoing relationship with Otto Penzer of the Mysterious Press. So he's published a number of my novellas and short story collections. I tend to write stories that accrue around um, certain themes or certain types of genre. I'm very drawn to the surreal, not a, not exactly fantasy, but the kind of fiction that bleeds into another dimension, so to speak. It it has a, a I think, a firmly realistic foundation, and then it, it eases into or morphs into this other dimension. So all the stories are in that of that genre. Yeah, and that's definitely something that we like here: is the surreal and the the creepy sort of stories like that? Yes. Uh, well, so say a bit more about your... You said you have this relationship with Otto Penciler and Mysterious Press. Say a little bit more about Mysterious Press, because this is associated with his bookstore, right? Well, it's, I don't think it's necessarily just uh, depending on the bookstore. I think Otto's done a lot of editing. He edits anthologies of mysteries and suspense fiction. And it all, I think, it's not terribly distinctive in terms of there being these categories. I mean, Otto is very friendly toward writing that is surreal or may verge upon gothic or horror. I don't think, I don't believe that he's thinking in terms of specific genres like mystery detective fiction. The psychological suspense fiction tends to be somewhat horrific psychological suspense depends upon there being something at stake of significance. And so I think one of the primary uh, motives for writing this kind of fiction also drove Ed Edgar Allan Poe, who supposedly invented the first detective story. But, but Poe was basically interested, I believe, in testing the limits and periphery of, of of sanity. Like where does sanity change or evolve or devolve into something else? And so mystery, detective fiction, is one expression of that, the, these questions. And then the gothic and horror and speculative science fiction is another extreme. So Otto Penzer, I think, is friendly to all this this kind of writing, but he's he's more associated with mystery and detective fiction. Yeah, yeah. Well, so let's start off and talk about your story, Mystery Inc. Uh, so it says it was originally published in the Mysterious Bookshop's Biblio Mystery Series. So tell us about that. Yes, yes. Well, Otto Penzler has a series. It's it has been going on for years now. I don't know how many. There must be 30 or 40, maybe more titles. And they're by people who are usually mystery writers or detective fiction writers. So Otto asks them to write a mystery story set in a bookstore or focused on books. So mine is focused on books and it's in a bookstore. Yeah. Well, I, re I really, really enjoyed the protagonist in this story. Could you talk a little bit about how you came up with this character? Well, let's see. The person actually is visiting Otto Penzler. Of course, I don't have the name of Otto. And, uh, the, the bookstore that he visits 
is not exactly Otto Penzler's bookstore. It's kind of a dream bookstore that Otto might might have liked. We're on the top floor. Uh, he's selling rare books and limited editions and works of art, sort of strange artifacts are for sale on the top floor, which I don't think is actually the case with the mysterious book shop. But in some of the first editions and the prices of things, of these these classical and famous novels, I did check with Otto. I mean, my research is based upon Otto's own, some of his own knowledge and his his own holdings in his bookstore. So the character who is the bookstore owner is based on Otto Penzler, but it is fiction. I have to say, you know, it is a story that's com- that's really completely fiction. But I wouldn't have written the story except Otto had a- requested it. And it took me years to find out how I could write about something that I, that I would find interesting. That's sort of a challenge to- for a writer to find something that you yourself are interested in writing. And then the protagonist is a fictitious character. That's all I can say, really. Right. I mean, would you describe this protagonist as a sociopath? Because he's 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 very he's kind of likable in a way, but he's very emotionally detached from the consequences of his actions. Yes, he's he is a psychopath, I would say. But then he meets in the bookstore owner somebody <laughs> even more like a psychopath. The the psychopath protagonist is doing what he's doing because he wants to acquire this bookstore and he wants to sort of take over. He's jealous and so forth. But the bookstore owner turns out to be somebody who commits evil or murder for no reason. He says to the protagonist, well, why do you need a reason to do this? The whole genre of mystery and detective fiction turns upon murder of different kinds murder with or, with or without motives. So the story or the novella, since it's fairly long, is kind of, um, I think, a good, good-natured good critique of the phenomenon of the mystery genre, the mystery detective genre that always depends upon people being killed, whether it's an Agatha Christie novel or something like Michael Connelly. You know, whether it's Raymond Chandler or Sarah Patetsky, you know, wherever, it all depends upon somebody being killed. So there's always a sacrifice of some person who is, has to be sacrificed for the state, sake of the work of art. Right. And you describe this, the way you describe this bookstore, you make it just sound so charming. And it makes me kind of sad because it seems like bookstores like this are kind of a dying breed. I, I think I actually saw Otto Penzler on a panel last year, and he was talking about how I think his store is the only dedicated mystery bookstore in New York still. Um, what do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, I'm sure. Well, it's very sad. But Otto does most of his business online. He has for years. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the book business is not doing well, the mystery books. He, he means that the actual physical stores are sort of dying away, which is really sad. Somebody else, well, somebody might disagree. Somebody might say, well, maybe there are new stores opening up in different places. Is there a lot? I'm in Berkeley right now, and there are many, many, many bookstores in Berkeley, actually. Okay, I also really want to ask you about this story, Equatorial, which is set in the Galapagos Islands. I was just wondering what kind of research on the Galapagos did you do? Have you been there? I have not. No, unfortunately, I have not. Well, reading the story will tell you what it's like. I also have another story called The Bereaved that came out in the Yale Review, and that's another story about the Galapagos. My husband and I went in December 2014, so the research is very minute. I was taking notes all the time, not just about where we were, but the kind of people that you meet and, you know, what you're doing on the ship and the kind of guide that you would have. It's quite, a, it's quite a unique place, and I'm really glad I went. We were there about a week. Mm. I mean, so did you have the idea for this story before you went on the trip, or did you have it during or after? 
Well, I often write about things that I experience, particularly if they have uh, unusual locations. Both stories, the setting is very specific to the Galapagos. One story is a Gothic story, and the other story is a realistic story, a psychologically realistic story in the Yale Review. So it's kind of interesting to look at the two stories with this, I mean, for me anyway, the same setting and how the genre determines how it's written, what the language is like, the pacing, and so forth. The other story is a very realistic portrait of a marriage, and the story that that's in in the Gal Master is a suspense mystery story where you don't exactly know what the motive for the husband's behavior is, and you don't exactly know what's going to happen when you're in a place like that. And when you're on the ship or ship where you're outside the jurisdiction of the United States, you're in this sort of never never land. The Amer you know, American laws don't apply when you're on the high <laughs> you're on the high seas. You're in some other zone. And many people don't know that when they go on cruises. Once you get out in these waters Women have been raped, people have been robbed. Things have happened to people, and they have no recourse. You can't go to a police officer. There isn't any. You can't go to a magistrate. I mean, you can't go anywhere. You're on board a ship, and there isn't any law. So anyway, it's complicated. And I found that fascinating to think about and, and write about Yes, yeah, so I was wondering, like, if you're on the ship or on the steps, are you looking around thinking, oh, this would be a good place to kill somebody? I'm thinking about a story. No. It's more like this, what the, the characters in the story. The woman is trying to survive. She's made a marriage that maybe is a mistake, but she really loves or feels a strong emotion for this man that she becomes frightened of him. Maybe he could easily kill her. She doesn't really know. So it's a genre. It's work of genre. In the in the more in a realistic story that I wrote for the that was published in the Yale Review, a husband and wife go on essentially the same trip. But their relationship is it's a more realistic relationship in the sense that they've been married a while and they've lost a daughter. She's the daughter has died, and their relationship comes to a kind of crisis in the Galapagos. The Galapagos is all about survival, and every lecture that you that you hear, you go out with a guide, and you're, you're hiking around on these islands, these lava islands, and, and all the lectures are really about survival of species, and many, many, many species that have become extinct. So you start thinking in terms of human beings and homo sapiens, and you start thinking about your own self as a specimen. The not thoughts that you would have maybe at home, but you do think about these things in the Galapagos. Right. I mean, one element in the story that really struck me is that you describe these incredibly poisonous apples called the little apples of death. Is that a yeah. real thing? Oh, yes. Yes. And the guide, our Indian guide said, I can touch these leaves, but you can't. But he couldn't eat the food because through many, many centuries or millennia, he has the genetic ability the tribe to which he belongs is mostly, actually mostly, destroyed by genocide by the Spanish. That's not in this story that you read, I think. I talk about the genocidal history of the, of the Spaniards who conquered this part of the world and how they decimated or almost completely wiped out indigenous people. But anyway, uh, European descended people don't have the genetic ability to even touch this tree. It's so, it's so poisonous. But you understand how 
evolution works and genetics and I mean you understand what it is. Yeah, talking yeah, about. sure, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the white people or the Caucasians who are upper middle class and have money, you know, they're sort of in this place where they're only protected by the fact that they have money. If they were left on the island, they would die like, you know, in 48 hours. <laughs> this, you know, we're, it's such a, an ironic situation where you, you come to these places and my husband will be going to Antarctica, you know, places where we could not survive at all, but because we have money and we're, we're Americans, we sort of go into these, these stark, starkly existential parts of the world, which, if you think about them, are sort of frightening, but they're very uh, evocative for writing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, one thing that really struck me about this story and a couple other stories in this book, too, is that they end just before the moment where presumably something really terrible is about to happen. And I was just wondering, yeah. Like, do you think that's the best way to tell a story like this? And do you ever go back and forth about whether you should actually show the awful thing happening at the end of the story or not? Oh, no, I would never do that. I don't. I wouldn't consider that artistic. I would consider that too explicit. No. Or for something for children or young people. No, I think adult fiction is much more suggestive and impressionistic. It should be more poetic in the sense that when we read a poem, we may read a poem five or six times, or with Emily Dickinson, you could read a poem like a hundred times, and it it suggests meanings and subtextual themes that are disturbing and powerful, so that we're made to think about it. If you spell everything out for the reader or the viewer, say in a movie, if everything's just spelled out, there's nothing left to think about. But my models were Hemingway or Faulkner, particularly Hemingway when I was in high school. Hemingway is a great artist of that which is left unsaid. He's a great artist of minimalism, understatement. But you can read a beautiful Hemingway story that's two pages long, and you can just be thinking about it, and if you're teaching it to students, you have a discussion, you know, and go on for hours, because it's such a work of art. But if it were a story by somebody else that has a beginning, middle, and end with an explicit ending, it's very, very little really to talk about. Maybe that's what popular art or culture is, that it's sort of blatant and not, doesn't deal with subtextual themes. Right. And so, so have you always, when you've, when you, throughout your life, when you've written these stories with these suspenseful aspects, did anyone ever try to discourage you from writing about murder and violence and try to write about kind of, quote-unquote, nicer subjects? Well, I don't know who that would be. Like, like teachers or adult, you know, parents or people like that? No. No, I don't think people would do that, do they, with, uh, with writers? I mean, who would, you wouldn't say to Stephen King, write something nice. I mean, who would ever have done that? I, I can't imagine that situation. They might express some di disapproval of something, but I don't think I'd be able to say write about something nice. I mean, the reason I the reason I asked that is because I I came across this article where it said that when Shirley Jackson published The Lottery in the New Yorker, that her mom wrote her a letter and said, "This is such a morbid story. Why can't you kids write nicer stories?" So <laughs> she got a whole lot of crazy letters. <laughs> no, most of the bad, most of the angry letters just stopped their subscriptions to the New Yorker. Well, she had a very silly mother. <laughs> she had a mother who, who wanted her to, to dress very so glamorously and wear lipstick and makeup and fix her hair. And her mother, I think, was living in San Francisco. That was a particular, sort of a particularly silly um, response, I think. <laughs> Um, well, actually, so two stories in this book, you have Gun Accident and Big Mama, both have teenage girls as protagonists, and one story is set in 1961 and the other is set in the present day. And I was just wondering, is it, like, what do you think about when you're writing teenage girl protagonists today versus in that time period? Oh, I'm not sure that I'm thinking anything specific. Um, I do write about adolescence. Sometimes 
sometimes boys, but usually girls. And I read about people in their 20s, and I read about people of every age, actually. So these are just two examples of teenage girls. But both of them are girls who are very insecure. And the sort of gun accident, the girl is, she's like a really good student. And she has a relationship with her teacher. And then the other story, the girl doesn't have a father. And her mother is not always home when she comes home from school. So she's she's sort of drifting off into another world where she's taken up by this other family. And it's a kind of cautionary tale. It's sort of like a horrific fairy tale. Yeah, because the character in, in Gun Accident felt kind of naive and innocent to me in a way that the character in Big Mama didn't. I was just wondering if that was a, to what extent that was the time period and to what extent it was just those characters. Well, I don't think the girl in Big Mama is any anything other than naive. She's innocent in the sense of, you know, I would say she's quite innocent. She gets a, She gets befriended by this other girl in the class and then drawn into this family. It's like a a false family where they're going to to use her in some horrible way, but she doesn't know that. And she has her her mother as not really a loving mother to her. So it's like, I would call it a malevolent fairy tale, a dark fairy tale, a sort of a dark fantasy. Gun accident is more of a realistic story, and Big Mama is moving into dark fantasy. I mean, the sense that I had in Big Mama was that the character did know that something bad was going to happen to her, but for whatever reason, she went along with it. Well, at the very end, she becomes passive. I think she's just drawn to this family. She's lonely. She has a girlfriend, she thinks. The father... There is this, again, a darkly malevolent fairy tale father who seems so warm and friendly. And she doesn't have her own father. Her father has just more or less abandoned her. So it's not that she doesn't care. I think that she's a victim. Right. Um, and then I also wanted to ask you about your story, Soldier. Uh, it, it really reminds me a lot of real life crime cases like George Zimmerman and Bernard Getz. And I was just wondering how much of well, uh, yes. it. Yeah, particularly, yes, both of them. Mm-hmm. Yes, Bernard Getz and, and Zimmerman. I don't remember what happened with Bernard Getz. I, I think maybe he, was he acquitted also? I believe he was, yeah. Yeah. Was well, an interesting phenomenon. I mean, it's a very political sort of look at the situation in which some individual is expressing the will or the wish of the collective. Bernard Getz was somebody who imagined himself like a soldier, and George Zimmerman also, kind of white nationalism, where you're fighting back against these encroaching evil people who have skin's darker than your own, and there's a kind of climate of paranoia in some parts of the United States, not not everywhere and not universally. Yeah, and I mean, what's, what Soldier really, what really struck me about that is just this idea that, uh, you know, there are these stories about what's happened, and you never really, if you weren't there, you never really know what happened, and you always, you might have your suspicions, but if you were to ever know the truth, it might turn out to be even much, much worse than you had even imagined. Yeah, I think that's always been true, especially with police-related violence against the powerless or mentally ill people or, or black people. But now now we have, have videos, so we can see you know what they're doing, which is usually pretty awful, the way the police would beat up unarm people or even shoot them in the back. But before that, there was just testimony, and since the person who was, who was murdered couldn't give any testimony, it was just a police officer 
who would testify that, you know, he was going for his gun or he made a threatening gesture toward me and I had to protect myself. So it's basically the story that you get in the media and what really happened is probably always pretty different. Right, but one thing that's really striking now with these body cameras on the police is that we have video of of these really terrible things and then they still don't get convicted. They still don't get convicted some of the time. So I think it's a deterrent, maybe. And uh, they don't always not get convicted. I mean, a lot of it's going on. I On Twitter, I follow Anon Cop Watch. So every day, if you're interested, and it's very depressing, every day you'll get some postings of what the police are doing all over the country and also in Canada. And basically, they're victimizing powerless people. So, I mean, I watch these. Sometimes there is a video, and you can see a black woman being thrown down on the ground. People getting out of their cars with their hands in the air who are thrown down, and eight, eight police officers jump on him or her. I mean, this goes on all the time, but the New York Times, for instance, would not be able to write about all these cases. It would just be like the whole newspaper would be filled with it. You know, basically the media can't deal with all the things that are going on, like the George Zimmerman kind of events that are going on around the country or in North America. The, the mainstream media can't really deal with it. So I think that online and Twitter and I think maybe particularly Twitter is, is good at revealing these things to people who didn't know anything about it. Now, in the time of Bernard Getz, we didn't have the Internet. But Bernard Getz would have been a natural, as a, as a hero for many people around the country. He would have been, had a website. He would have had a defense fund. He may have had those. He may have had a defense fund anyway. But I think George Zimmerman got many, many thousands of dollars. So the story is based on that and based on a person who is speaking in his own voice and like how this happened to him and and what this does for his ego and how in some strange way he himself is a victim, how he finds that he gets the gun from his uncle and one thing leads to another. Right. And I know I know that you've been teaching writing classes in prison. I was just wondering if that's changed the way that you thought about crime or wrote about crime. Well, not really. My husband and I both have volunteered taught at San Quentin. And I went out to San Quentin about five times and did workshops with another another teacher. And basically it's helping the helping the young well they're not necessarily young, but helping the writer inmates learn to write, to communicate clearly. And it's sort of on an elementary level, you know. I'm also teaching at UC Berkeley right now. So it's not the same kind of writing. And I teach at NYU graduate school. So those people are really maybe already published. And then for them it's a matter of fine-tuning how they write. The prison writing is on another level. It would be more like maybe high school writing. They may have stories to tell, but they need help just with sentences and, you know, on that level. I think there's a high number of prisoners in the United States are functionally illiterate, something like 70%. So it's very high. I mean, have any of those stories that you've heard from inmates really stuck with you? No. Not really. I also edited a book called Prison Noir. And those are real, those are finished and polished stories that were written by prisoners all around the country. There's one from San Quentin, but they're from all over. And those stories now, I would say our real story in prison noir. And there are, there are three by women. There are not very many stories by women prisoners because of, there are not as many women prisoners at all compared to men. So the stories are, are realistic and they're, 
none of them are gothic or, or fantasy or science fiction at all. It's kind of interesting. The prisoners write about their own experiences of prison and how they got there. Very often they write about what they did that got them in prison and all the different circumstances that, that led to it. It's the great mystery of their lives, you know. Somebody who's intelligent realizes he's in prison and maybe for life. So they start thinking and, and, they, and they want to write about it. It's obsessive. And so in the stories in Prison Noir, most of them are autobiographical, and they're all quite good. I'd say they're almost all autobiographical. The women's stories are so heartrending because these are women, in one case in particular from Michigan, she killed an insanely abusive husband, so abusive to her and so threatening to her and her children. She basically had to kill this person. And she did. So she's in prison. And she she's somebody who should have been a teacher. She should, she was very intelligent and writes very well, but she married the wrong man. And he was not a crude person. He was actually a lawyer. He would strang, start to strangle her. He would threaten the children. And she, she shot him. She killed him nearly in self-defense. So anyway, that's the kind of story that, that could definitely influence another writer. But my teaching at San Quentin was not really on that level. The stories that I received from the, from the student inmates were not anything like college stories. It's just maybe begin, beginnings. I did, I did write a story called San Quentin, which is purely fiction, based more on my husband. My husband was teaching a biology course in which they dissected sheep brains. So that's in my story, but I never had that experience. That story is called San Quentin. Oh, all right, cool. I'll have to check that out. Um, see, I also wanted to ask you, so the, the title story in this collection is called The Doll Master, and it's dedicated to Ellen Datlow, who's a, a horror editor that I know because I, I live in New York and I see her sometimes. So I was just curious about, could you talk about why you uh, dedicated that story to her? Well, it's, the story was originally written for Ellen. So I'm going to walk into another room now. I have a book that Ellen edited. It's called The Doll Collection. Do you know this book? Yeah, yeah. I got a copy of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So my story is obviously in here. At least I think it's in here. I've written a lot of stories for Ellen Datlow over the years going way, way back, you know, like nineteen eighties or something. I would got a letter from someone named Ellen Datlow, would you like to write a story with a certain theme? And I said, I'd like to try. So I've always done that. And Ellen has asked me a number of times in many, many of her anthologies. She's got these different weird ideas. But this is I think possibly her best book with the pictures, the interesting Photographs. I think maybe some of them are her own. So Ellen is someone I'd probably have dedicated. I mean, I've dedicated books to Ellen, at least one book to Ellen. Oh, and now I'm looking at also edited by Ellen Datlow. Oh my God, she's edited <laughs> so many anthologies. Wow. I mean, all sorts of things that that. Like Black Heart, Ivory Bones. I think I might be in there. Black Swan, White Raven. The Lovecraft Unbound. I think I'm in there. Lethal Kisses. I mean, I think I'm in a number of these anthologies. It's very impressive. She did a number of them with Terry Windling. Some of them I've never seen, but I'd be interested in. So she sometimes has asked me to do things when I wasn't able to but they seem really interesting. Then she has a new anthology that will be out next year called Black Feather. Black Feathers? So she said, it's all about birds. So I did have an idea because when I live in Princeton, we live on a lake and there are great blue herons around the lake. And there's almost like prehistoric looking birds. 
the strangely awkward, the beautiful, and the real predators. Do you know what a great throw heron looks like? Uh, probably not in great detail, no. So you're, you're a city person, is that right? Uh, I live just outside New York City, yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, if you're out in the country and you're near marshland, you might see these great blue herons. They fly by, and they look really prehistoric. They have very, very long beaks, long necks. Their wings are quite wide and quite large. Then their their legs hang down, and you see them skimming low over a creek or a river or in a marshland. They're all, they're hunting, and they hunt alone. So anyway, I wanted to write about about that. So the whole story is generated by living there, being fascinated by the birds. These predator birds are so big and and rather beautiful, and then. Ellen's invitation, it just kind of all came together. <laughs> so is that a, a fantasy or a horror kind of story that you wrote? It starts off as a pretty realistic story, and then it, it goes into that other zone, and it becomes something that's surreal. We're not exactly sure if this woman is losing her mind or whether these things are really happening. I said at the beginning of our conversation that the great theme of Edgar Allan Poe, I think, is testing the limits of sanity. And almost all his stories deal with the terror of losing one's mind. The Telltale Heart, for instance, is a story about a man who goes mad. And he tells us why, really. And... It's it's the a beautiful story, beautifully cadenced and paced story of insanity. But Poe has a number of stories like that. Well, yeah, and you wrote a Poe story called The Fabled Lighthouse at Vigna del Mar, and that's definitely about someone yeah, losing yeah. his mind. <laughs> well, yeah, he was in this place, though, that to survive, you'd have to become like an animal, you know, and Poe himself was in, in this Gothic tradition, 19th century romantic Gothic tradition, where nobody has any bodies. You know, he talks about women very pale and, and beautiful long hair and so forth. But never any actual bodies, and men don't have any bodies. He doesn't write in a, in a realistic way, like, say, John Updike. So I wanted to take that, that idea of the non-physical romantic Gothic and put that person in a really real physical universe where he would have to survive by eating these horrible animals. Nobody eats anything in, in, in Poe. I mean, nobody ever has a sandwich, let's say, or <laughs> drink some milk or something. You know, all these things that we take for granted in our daily lives don't exist in Gothic literature or in tragedy. We never we never see Hamlet putting on his socks. We never see Ophelia curling her hair, and nobody is doing any laundry. Nobody goes to the bathroom. Nobody takes a shower. Nobody has his hair cut. You know, and on and on. All these things that belong to what we call realistic fiction don't exist in Gothic fiction. So the horror for a Gothic personality would be to have to be in that real world where to survive you have to eat, and you have to eat some horrible-looking turtle <laughs> or something, something with one eye in the middle of its forehead. So it was, for me, kind of an experimental thing to take the sensibility of the 19th century Gothic and subject it to what would be absolutely horrific for them would be to be in a physical world. Yeah, wow, that's really interesting. Um, I mean, a minute ago, you mentioned the Ellen Datlow's Lovecraft Unbound anthology. And I read your story, Commencement, that was in that. I was wondering if you could just talk about how you came up with that story. Well, Commencement is a story that's based on my my receiving honorary doctorates and going to the commencement services, which lasts a ceremony, which lasts a long time. And you're sitting in a robe, and often you're sitting in the sun. And all these people come across the stage getting their degrees. 
And so it just seemed to me a natural next step, you know, would be to tie it in with these ancient Aztec ritual religious uh, executions where people's hearts are torn out. So I sort of mold, melded together the realistic experience of receiving honorary doctorates of colleges and universities with the fantastic and the dark fantasy of the, the ritual, the Aztec ritual. Yeah, and so you're saying sort of that because the uh, <laughs> the ceremonies are so unbearable to sit through that uh, when, when you actually turn it into a literal human sacrifice, that's just kind of... Uh communicating the same idea in even more elevated terms? Well, I don't know that they're that awful to sit to. I mean, it's literally not like having your heart torn out. It's more that you're sitting there, and so your mind is wandering. I've sat, you know, for a couple of hours at these ceremonies, and you have to be thinking about something. You can't read. Some people, some professors probably try to read. But if you're the honorary doctorate, people are sitting right in the front. And you may have to stand up and give a little commencement speech yourself. So you basically sit there, and the people come across the stage, and there's music, and there's a prayer, and all this goes on for a long, long time. So if you have an active imagination, you just take the situation and, and try to invent something. So when I was finished with it, I could go home and write the story. I'm sure that Stephen King is had experiences like this where he imagines something because of a certain situation that he's in. Uh, writers have these somewhat horrific situations where they have, they're have being operated on or they're having chemotherapy or x-ray or women having an abortion. Um, you know, one or the other of all these different things where you're trapped in some place. But your mind is not trapped. So your mind starts to imagine something. And and so why did you think that that story was appropriate to link with H.P. Lovecraft? I'm not sure. I may have said to Ellen a couple of stories that may have been that Ellen made the choice. I don't remember exactly. I've done so many stories with Ellen. She may She may have made a choice personally. I mean, you are interested in Lovecraft, right? Because you edited a collection of Lovecraft's writings called Tales of H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah, I have another story. I thought my Lovecraft story was a different story. I thought it was called Shadows of the Evening. You were talking about Commencement. Well, yeah, are they yeah, both... com commencement was in Lovecraft Unbound. I don't know if maybe, maybe you had a story in a different Lovecraft anthology. Yeah, there's another one called Shadows of the Evening which is much more of a Lovecraft story than a uh, commencement. Shadows of the Evening is based upon a Lovecraft story. Oh, I can't remember the title of a Lovecraft story. One of his early stories. One of his more realistic stories. Where somebody hears somebody playing an instrument. Is oh, the music of Eric Zahn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was it. Mm -hmm. So my story, The Shadows of the Evening, is not about that, really. It's about somebody who hears someone singing at a distance. She hears a voice singing, and she's drawn out of her house and goes into a city and goes into a strange place, maybe like a church, and she discovers who is, she discovers who's singing. So it definitely was evolved from the Lovecraft story. Okay, no, I'll definitely check that out. Yeah, I, I didn't know you had another Lovecraft story, so now I'm curious to read that. Um, and so then I also wanted to ask you about, I just came across your review of Margaret Atwood's book, In Other Worlds, in the New York Review of Books, where she's talking about the criticism that she got from Ursula K. Le Guin about whether her books are science fiction or not. I was just curious if you had any thoughts about that. Gee, I don't know really what to think about that. To me, the genres should not be in, inflexible. They should not be confining. I think that one can really should just write about anything. You know, science fiction is a very broad term. Speculative fiction is almost every, almost all fiction is speculative. And 
I'm just not really comfortable with anybody trying to define something. People ask me what I write, and I say, well, basically, it's psychological realism. Because even if I write about a surreal experience, the person who has that experience, I would consider reacting in a, in a realistic way. So science fiction has gotten very, very broad. What was the issue again? Ursula Le Guin was saying... Uh, so, so Margaret Atwood would say that books like The Handmaid's Tale or Oryx and Crake aren't quote-unquote science fiction, and Ursula Gwynn said that she should say that they are science fiction because the label science fiction has always applied to books like that. I, don't, I really don't know why anybody would even care about... You know, I, I don't think Margaret Atwood really cares about the issue that much. Maybe it got exaggerated. Margaret Atwood is saying, if you expect, if you open my novel, you're not going to find a spaceship, you're not going to find monsters, or you're not going to find traveling through some galaxy, and so don't be disappointed. That's what she was really suggesting, that if you read her, basically you are reading psychological realism. She's kind of a political writer. She's a cultural critic. She's interested in many, many ideas. And that's what she's really writing about. She's not writing classical science fiction in which people go in a spaceship to Mars. So I think she just wanted people not to be disappointed in what she was doing. But Ursula Le Guin was sort of taking a wrong interpretation of that. And so some disagreement arose. But I don't see much of a disagreement. Mm -hmm. I I think the issue is that a lot of people refuse to read any books that are labeled science fiction. And so, yeah, yeah. So I, I think Ursula Le Guin would say that it's important for people to try to destigmatize the label science fiction because it's contributing to this unhealthy uh, schism within the literary community. Yes, many people would not read anything that was science fiction, but they also wouldn't read women's romance, and they wouldn't read mystery detective fiction or police procedurals or legal thrillers. There's all these genres you see in bookstores. People, Some people love them, and other people hate them. So classic science fiction, I think, is someone like H.G. Wells. He's a really great writer, and he's using a genre for his ideas. H.G. Wells is a fantastic writer. Um, quite subtle, and he's not really a science fiction writer in the sense that he wants to tell a tale about someone who is a time traveler. He's really using the idea of time travel to critique his own civilization. Right, but I mean, I think a lot of science fiction authors, I mean, do that, you know, I mean, I don't think that that's um, uh, alien to the project of science fiction to provide political commentary. I think that's, uh, you know, pretty much inherent in the genre since the beginning. Yes, among the writers who are still read. But I do remember many years ago when I was a girl, I would see these pulp magazines. I don't remember the name of it, but on the cover would be like a spaceship or a monster and somebody else would have a um, a laser gun or something and, and something with tentacles would be coming out of a, somebody's head. Those were cla classic science fiction of a type. They didn't have any particular ideas. They were basically about going to Jupiter and coming back or them coming here, you know. I don't think they had the intellectual dimension of Margaret Atwood or Doris Lessing or Ursula or H.G. Wells, these stories that I'm referring to are pretty, were pretty crude. And there was true detective, and mystery detective, and romance. So I, I don't know that they're even published anymore. They were, they were paperbacks. That was the kind of science fiction that people, a lot of people did not want to read. But people are happy to read all this Huxley. Or 1984, George Orwell, you know, that, that's more like speculative fiction. Well, right. I, I think the pulp magazine you're, you're talking about, like uh, Amazing Stories or Astounding Science Fiction, 
they a lot of the stuff in them was was really bad and they had these awful covers but a lot of the stuff in them was actually really interesting like isaac asimov's foundation series was published in the pulp magazines it was published in astounding and that's certainly full of you know very rigorous thought experiments i suppose so but at the time a person who was say walking by a newsstand he would just be turned away by the the idea of the genre you know, he stays reading the New Yorker. Instead, he's just not going to read amazing science fiction tales or whatever it was. So that's what Ursula Le Guin is, is referring to, that kind of division. Now, in present time, or maybe the late 20th century, I think the boundaries definitely have broken down, and we don't have such such a dislike of science fiction. The movie 2001 was very popular, and in a sense, that's almost a like classic science fiction where there's a, a spaceship. It was, in some ways, psychologically realistic and, and very, very be- beautifully done, very mysterious. Yeah. Well, and speaking of that, I wanted to ask you, because uh, a good friend of mine in New York is this guy, Matthew Kressel. Uh, he does the KGB re- Fantastic Fiction Reading Series at the KGB Bar, along with Ellen Datlow. So I don't know if you if you might oh, know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to read there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did read there once years ago. Um, but so he had a story in Lightspeed Magazine called "The Sounds of Old Earth," and you said very nice things about it on Twitter. So I just wanted to to thank you for that because I know Matt really appreciated that. Oh, good, good. Yeah, I use I, I use Twitter to recommend things quite often. But my own writing sort of sprawls across a number of genres. So I think people have, have had a difficult time trying to categorize my writing or classify it. If you say if you if you like John Updike's writing or Ann Tyler, they're basically domestic realists. They write about domestic life often about marriage and family, in a, in a realistic way. It's not very dr- melodramatic. It's not tragic. It's kind of realism, you know. But I, I've sometimes written domestic realism, which I like very much. But I could just, but my next book could be completely surreal and unpredictable. It could have vampires in it. And then my next novel after that could be completely realistic. I might do a historical novel set some time ago. You know, all my, my writing is somewhat unclassifiable, so it's hard to it's hard for an average reader to figure out what I was doing. Right. Well, I mean, I, I really enjoyed The Doll Master and Other Tales of Terror. I mean, a lot of short story collections and anthologies, you know, it's kind of hit or miss with the stories. But there are six stories in this book, and I thought they were all just really, really good. So I would really encourage thank people you. to go check it out. Well, thank you. Well, they're a little longer than usual. And some of them are almost like novellas. Yeah. Yeah. No, but like I said, I, I really enjoyed the book. And do you have, uh, Joyce, do you have any other projects you want to mention or just anything else you want to mention here? Well, I think the topics of genre that we that we've talked about a little bit is very interesting, and why there is a kind of maybe unre- unreasonable dislike of some genres, and the fact that I think in the present time the the boundaries between the genres are sort of dissolving, and there's there's more interest in speculative fiction, science fiction. But just a lot of writers who are, in some ways, realistic writers, like George Saunders. Do you know his work? Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah. George Saunders is, is a strange hybrid. I mean, he's a wonderful writer and very quite unique and poetic, a little like Donald Bartholomew. But he's writing about a kind of America that you're seeing through the prism of his sensibility. In other words, it is America, and it is somehow real, but the lens of his sensibility has distorted it. But then maybe it's not really distorted, but expressed in the way that that is real. You know, maybe the maybe the surface of things is a distortion, and fiction brings out the reality. Yeah, no, I read his collection. It was called Civil Warland in Bad Decline. Yeah, and, it's great, isn't it? Yeah, and that's definitely a book that would appeal to science fiction readers as well as probably anyone else. 
Yeah, yeah. He's like down the bar for me, maybe um, a little more playful or morbid or audacious. There's some there's some George Saunders pieces that are actually not fiction. They're just kind of playful. So there is the the George Saunders voice is probably why we're reading it. The Donna Barthamy voice. And no matter what they write about, it's it's this particular voice that's playful but also mordant and the humor is disturbing. And I, I admire that kind of writing. But my next novel is a very realistic novel, and it's purely real. It's, it's pure realism. It's not really like the the doll master. The next novel is about the issue of division in America between people who are pro-life, anti-abortion, people who are very liberal and pro-choice. And like the the way America is today, it seems like a to me, almost like a nightmare of these divisions. People who are passionately pro-Trump and people who are passionately for Bernie Sanders. And it's like they're living in the same country, but they're, they're in different dimensions. Do you feel that way too? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um... And it's, so, it's like a nightmare almost. It's almost, I mean, it's almost sort of scary. There are so many pro-Trump people. They don't seem to look at him. They don't seem to see him the way we see him. They see him literally as some kind of a savior. He's going to bring jobs back and help them. These are poor people who haven't even worked in years, some of them. They really think that Donald Trump is going to bring back their factory job, you know, in Indiana or someplace. But I guess they really believe that. Then... Bernie Sanders people may have some uh, idealistic notions that maybe they're not so realistic either. I'm much more Bernie Sanders than I am Donald Trump. But it's kind of interesting that that America is, is impassioned by these two poles that are so far apart. I mean, they're far apart in a way, but they're also very similar in a lot of ways because they're both promising to upend the established system. And for people who have not been served well by the established system, that's very appealing. Well, in what way is Trump going to upend the system? He's not going to get rid of capitalism. He's a capitalist. I mean, he's, he wants to tax... He he doesn't believe... Anyway, he, he wants lower taxes for a billionaire. It's basically... He's basically saying the same thing that it's somehow deceiving people I don't even think he's really a racist he just he sounds as if he's a racist and that makes some people excited because they're racist but when it comes down to it New York he's a New Yorker he's lived with all sorts of different people I don't think he really is a racist he sounds like a racist and he may be a misogynist or a sexist but his daughters like him so much and some women seem to like him it's basically, he's, he said, I'll make America great again and bring back jobs. He has no way of doing that. There's no way you can do that. I mean, it's just sort of talk. Bernie Sanders could actually, if he were president, he he could do something about taxes and he he's going to get rid of this and that. I mean, he, he has been in Congress for for many, many years. I mean, Trump has no experience in government which is all about compromise and making making deals. He doesn't understand what he'll, I mean, he'd have to make deals with somebody like Clinton or Sanders. Anyway, my novel is sort of about America as this nightmare place where people are living near together, but they're in different zones of consciousness, which I see as something tragic. Right. And it seems like technology has played a huge role in that because it's allowed people to immerse themselves in media cocoons that just echo their own opinions back at them and they never have to be confronted with uh, contrary opinions. Exactly. You're exactly right. That's exactly right. They, they uh, immerse themselves in media cocoons. They only go to certain websites. They have their Twitter feed or whatever. 
they only read certain things and they watch Fox News or they listen to Rush Limbaugh. They would never dream of watching Larry Wilmore or John Stewart in the past. You know, you're quite right. They don't read the New York Times. I would never dream of reading the New York Times. Anyway, my novel is about that and how what it's like to be in families on both sides of that issue. The families who are very religious and families who are who are very liberal. Right. So why don't you tell us again, what's the name of that novel and when will it be out? Well, the novel is coming out, I think, in January or February. It's called A Book of American Martyrs. But as I said, it's a very realistic novel. So I did research into abortion providers and the assassinations of abortion workers and Planned Parenthood uh, workers and sabotage against them. But, uh, but it's also from the point of view of the people who really, really believe in pro-life. I mean, they're not just malicious, awful people. They really believe they're very religious, the fundamental, fundamentalist Christians. But then I also write about the people who are very liberal and good agnostic, perhaps. But they believe that women have a, women should control their own bodies. So it's just a, it's an ideological difference that has led to many tragic misunderstandings, and I don't see any way to resolve it in the near future. Yeah, well, I mean, it sounds really interesting and. Uh... Maybe some of our listeners will check it out because you can't just read science fiction all the time. You have to read some other stuff, too. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Bye-bye. Right. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Joyce. Bye-bye. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Joyce Carol Oates for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Reader541 in the UK, who writes, Absolutely my favorite podcast. Excellent discussions, interesting authors, and incisive questions. Thank you. I'm rereading Douglas Adams, just finished Limbo, discovered Lightspeed, and I'm just about to buy Tim Powers' The Anubis Gates, a major part of my life. So big thanks again to Reader541 for that great review. And of course, special thanks to John Haggerty, Tate Williams, and Ralph Walker, who all just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Ralph also writes, David, you've created something special with this podcast. It seems like every episode gets better. Excellent work. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Neil Easterbrook, who just made a very generous contribution to the show via PayPal. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.